Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and join us this evening on EWTN. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line with today's host, Father Wade Menezes. In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Pay no attention to what that man is telling you. We are having some problems with our telephone system, so uh, at least at the beginning of the program, we won't be able to take your phone calls. If that problem should be rectified by the end of the show, we will let you know, and we'll give you the thumbs up that you can start dialing in. But in the meantime, Friday is the Feast of the Sacred Heart, and Father Wade is going to give us a little pontification on the twin hearts, the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and we'll get to that in just a few moments. Now, if you are watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into that chat window, and that's how you can be part of the program live today. Uh, in the meantime, we will take some emails which have piled up over the weeks, and we uh, may have a listener comment line call or two. Uh, or we may not have a listener comment line call or two. And I am told by our producer extraordinaire, Mr. Michael McCall, that we do not have any listener comment line calls. So Mr. McCall is unprepared. And for... <laughs> so we have... So lubricate the windpipe there, uh, Father Wade, and get the vocal cords tuned up and ready to go. Um, so we won't be giving out the phone numbers to... Can I do some okay. Gregorian chant? Yeah, I don't know that that's really good at, uh, you know, there's that wall that people hit in the middle of the afternoon, and that might just push yeah. them right into a nice little meditative I might slumber. Disturb all those, I might disturb all those who are taking a little <laughs> siesta right now. That's exactly right. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program, and he's, he does a fine job. I was just teasing him, by the way. And there's a piece of glass between us, so he can't do anything to me during the program as he opens the door and wanders out into the studio now. Um, but at any rate, um, your call screener and social media maven, he's your social media maven right now. If the phones get repaired, he will be your call screener also as Mr. Jeff Burson, magnificent person. And our host, as he is every Tuesday, to pontificate, as promised, on the Twin Hearts is Father Wade Menezes. How are you? I'm doing great, Jack. And yes, following Trinity Sunday and then Corpus Christi Sunday this guess, past Sunday. Yeah, guess where I'm going to be on Friday? Oh, on the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In, in Alabama or out of Alabama? Out of Alabama. Oh my gosh, that could be anywhere. With your travels, that could be anywhere. <laughs> get a load, <laughs> where are you going to be? Get a load of this. On Friday, the Feast of the Sacred Heart, I will be in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Beautiful downtown Fort Lauderdale, Florida, on the uh, right on the water, uh, at Heart of Jesus Maronite Catholic Church. How oh, about that? Be beautiful. How about beautiful. that? That is awesome. That is awesome to be under uh, at, at a church under the patronage of the Sacred Heart on the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart. That is indeed pretty awesome. Uh, Holy Mother Church gives us this great solemnity following Corpus Christi, and of course, the Saturday following it is the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And I think I want to talk about Mama Mary first and her Immaculate Heart, uh, and then show how the two kind of differ in regards to the mind of Holy Mother Church. But uh, the Immaculate Heart of Mary is a Roman Catholic devotional name, we could say, Jack, used to refer to the Catholic view of the interior life of Mary, the mother of Jesus, of her joys and sorrows, her virtues and her hidden perfections, and above all, her virginal love for God the Father, her maternal love for her son, Jesus Christ, and her mystical spousal love for the Holy Spirit, and her motherly and compassionate love for all of mankind. The Immaculate Heart of Mary is also the most perfect reflection of the love and purity of the most sacred heart of Jesus. How is this? Well, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, of the Mother of God, gave the incarnate Word his whole and entire humanity. The blood that was shed by him, his hands and feet that were pierced for us, as well as his sacred heart that showed pity to the needy and the sick crowds during his three years of public ministry and throughout all of his life, Mary's Immaculate Heart is a refuge, then, for each one of us who seek to follow her divine Son. That is, her one goal is to lead us more closely to her Son. 
Whatever we ask, for example, strength to overcome temptation, courage to arise after a fall, patience to endure our crosses, anything to draw closer to her Son and to the Father and to the Holy Spirit can be found by turning to her, the Mother of God, and looking especially to her Immaculate Heart. Now, the main difference between the devotions to the most sacred heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we could say, is that the Sacred Heart devotion emphasizes Christ's divine heart as being full of love for all of mankind, yet this love being largely ignored and rejected by mankind. This is where the word reparation comes in. We want to make reparation to the Sacred Heart because of the great love that's ignored by mankind. While devotion to Mary's Immaculate Heart is essentially concerned with the love that her heart has to lead us all to her son. That's her goal. Honoring Mary's Immaculate Heart is really just another way of honoring Mary as the very person who has who was chosen to be the mother of God, recognizing her extraordinary holiness and the immense love she bestowed on Jesus as his mother and as the person who was called to share in and cooperate in his redemptive sufferings. The aim of devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, then, is to unite mankind to God through Mary's heart, and this process involves the ideas of consecration and reparation to her son's heart. A person is consecrated to Mary's Immaculate Heart and to her son's heart as a way of being completely devoted to Almighty God. This involves a total gift of self, something only ultimately possible with reference to God himself. But Mary is our intermediary in this process of consecration, and of course, Christ himself is the chief and sole primary mediator to God the Father. Because of the strong analogy between Jesus and Mary here regarding their hearts, the consecration to Mary's Immaculate Heart is closely linked then to the consecration to Jesus' uh, Sacred Heart, although it is subordinate and dependent upon it, and that's an important point to make. That is, although the act of consecration is ultimately addressed to God, it is an act that is made through Mary as Mother of God. And so we say, with great love and devotion, Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. And then looking to the most sacred heart of Jesus, uh, it's a profound symbol of the core belief of Christianity, right? And that is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God made man, loves each of us immeasurably and without exception. Although pierced terribly by our sins, the sacred heart of our Lord overflows with compassion and love for all of mankind, even when that love is not reciprocated. Therefore, the devotion to the most sacred heart of Jesus is one of the most important devotions among Catholics. It became popular following the apparitions of Jesus to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, a Catholic nun from France between the years of 1673 and 1675. During his visits to her, Jesus promised, quote, to all those who receive Holy Communion on the first Fridays of nine consecutive months, I will grant the grace of final perseverance. They shall not die in my disgrace, nor without receiving their sacraments. My divine heart shall be their refuge in this last moment. End quote. The church dedicates the entire month of June to the most sacred heart of Jesus, remembering always that we were loved first by God Catholics strive to venerate and imitate the most generous and sacred heart of Jesus. And uh, just a, a few more points here about the sacred heart. You know, stop and think about it, right? In, in his human nature, uh, subsisting in his divine personage as the second person of the Trinity, along with his divine nature, the two natures, human and divine, subsisting in the one divine personage of Christ, what we call the doctrine of the hypostatic union, in his human nature... Our Lord had a real, viable, pumping, bloody human heart. For the 33 years he walked the earth, according to sacred tradition, 33 years, our God is therefore a revealed God. Huh? He's, he's revealed. He had the five senses like we do. Huh? St. Athanasius says, God became man so that man may become like God through a life of his divine grace working in man's life. The creator became a creature, I like to say. Uh, this is like saying, Jack, that the architect literally became the blueprint of the house he was working on, or that the potter became the cup at the wet spinning wheel. Well, our, our minds don't even lend themselves to that imagery, and yet that's exactly what God did. Huh? The architect became 
the house or, or the blueprint and the potter became the cup. The creator became a creature. Uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen once said, quote, Almighty God made us in his own image and likeness so that one day he might assume our own image and likeness. And of course, he's talking about the book of Genesis there, that in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, the human person is made in God's image and likeness. And so poetically speaking then, the human heart is a profound symbol of the following, of love, of mercy, of faithfulness, of steadfastness, of commitment, of passion. That is that love that suffers for the other, huh? passio in the Latin. Uh, love that is willing to suffer for the other. It's also a symbol of loyalty, of diligence, of anchoring, say, in the virtues, being anchored, a foundation of the virtues. And the human heart is seen as that anchor, that foundation of a balanced emotional life involving the feelings or emotions. It's EWTN's Open Line Tuesday with Father Wade Menezes. This is Conversations with Consequences, where we delve deeper into issues affecting our church, our country, and our core, the family. As Catholics, we need to be informed, aware, and able to talk through some of the tough topics that we're facing in our culture and in our world. Conversations with Consequences gives us the tools to do so. It's not enough to pray. We have to be a light for the world. Conversations with Consequences, this Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. In scriptures, we often see Jesus the Messiah, the Good Shepherd, the author of life, and the wonderful counselor. After all, who knows our minds better than our Savior, and what behaviors and actions lead us to holiness? In Jesus the Master Psychologist, Listen to Him, popular Catholic psychologist and EWTN radio and TV host Dr. Ray Garendi directs us to the root of all healthy counseling found in the words of the Creator Himself. In his own down-to-earth style, Dr. Ray explores modern psychology in the light of Christ and His Church to identify the therapy tools worth trying and what to avoid. Experience the Gospels on a deeper level with Jesus, the Master Psychologist. Listen to Him by Dr. Ray Garendi. The latest release from EWTN Publishing. Now available at EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Today's Open Line is recorded, so no calls, please. If you'd like to send us an email for a future show, the address is openline at EWTN.com. You know, uh, I don't know if you knew or not, but EWTN has a Vatican Bureau, EWTN News. Uh, From Rome to your home, you can watch all the important events from Rome, even if you don't have TV access. Uh, Using the latest technology, we've made it possible to watch the latest news from the Holy See, all of it delivered directly to your home via live streams. From Rome to your home, the EWTN Vatican Bureau brings you the coverage you won't want to miss. Watch live on EWTN's YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Again, our phone lines are down uh, currently. If they get back up, we'll give you the high sign. You can call in. But until then, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window, and we will pose that question to Father Wade. He's talking about the most sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary. Father Wade, I know you've got a couple things you want to say, but this one paragraph, and I've seen this from you before, Jesus told St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, to all the, and l- listen, I'm the first one at the top of this list that I'm about to ridicule. To all those who receive Holy Communion on the first Fridays of nine consecutive months, I will grant the grace of final perseverance. They shall not die in my disgrace, nor without receiving their sacraments. Why on earth would you not make that devotion? <laughs> yeah, amen. Amen. You know, uh, a little bit more about that. Uh, the nine first Fridays the church has answered must be consecutive. Uh, they must be made in honor of and in reparation to our Lord's most sacred heart. 
uh, as was noted in my springboard, uh, the whole purpose of the Sacred Heart is to honor the love that is forgotten huh, of Jesus towards mankind. And then also receive Holy Communion on each first Friday. In other words, to go to Mass and receive Holy Communion with the intention of honoring Christ's Sacred Heart. If one is not in a state of grace and thus unable to receive Holy Communion, you would need to go to confession, obviously, uh, just before the first Friday to, in order to receive on the first Friday or, or go to confession on the first Friday. But obviously to receive Holy Communion on any day, for any reason, you need to have the moral certitude you're in a state of grace, which means no known mortal sin on your soul, grave matter, fullness of knowledge, and done with deliberate consent of your will. So, um, and it is possible to have the moral certitude that you are in a state of sanctifying grace by being able to say, you know what, to the best of my sincerest of knowledge, I'm not aware of any mortal sin I've committed. And, and you go with... Uh, with full faith to Holy Communion. So those are the requirements. Uh, I want to say, say a few more things, Jack, about that uh, devotion to the Most Sacred Heart. It's just a, a wonderful, wonderful devotion. Uh, the solemnity of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus assures us that God has eliminated all distance, we could say, huh, between us and Him, loving us from within our own human nature, which He Himself took on. This solemnity of the most sacred heart of Jesus means that a divine person loves us with a perfect human heart. Consequently, our own wounded human hearts are consoled and perfected by his sacred heart. We have only to unite our hearts to Christ's heart to receive all that it contains, and we look to Mary's heart to lead us there. Huh? Again, our Lord promised St. Margaret Mary that, quote, sinners shall find in my heart, the source and the infinite ocean of mercy. That sounds so much like different passages from St. Faustina's diary. Uh, and, quote, those who shall promote this devotion to my heart shall have their names written in my heart, never to be blotted out. And so just to wrap up this then on, on the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the solemnity itself reveals the merciful love of our Savior and should banish from us all fear, shame, and discouragement that might exist in our own hearts. Uh, the heart of Jesus continues to beat for us in heaven, pouring out its infinite merits upon us through the sacraments of the church. This is why it's so important, Jack, to remain close to the sacraments, especially those two that can be received over and over and over again with much frequency, frequent Eucharist and confession. Devotion to the most sacred heart of Jesus remains one of the church's greatest treasures and preeminent devotions and one of our greatest consolations on our pilgrim way. Our Lord promised St. Margaret Mary Alacoque that sinners shall find again in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. What a, what a beautiful truth that is. And again, that all those who shall promote this devotion shall have their names written in my heart, never to be blotted out. So as I said, regarding the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Pray for us, O Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Because whenever you invoke any of the three divine persons for prayer on, your, on one's behalf or on behalf of a group, for example, the response is, have mercy on us. So, O Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. And with the Blessed Virgin or St. Joseph or the saints or the angels, it's pray for us. So, Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. O Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Thanks, Father Wade, for sharing that with us. Again, our phone lines are down, so we are uh, going to take some emails, maybe a listener comment line call or two. And you can interact with us live via YouTube or Facebook Live. And that's what Albert did in Malta, of all places, watching us on YouTube. And he says, Father Wade, in view of the close relationship between the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, is it correct to call her co-redemptrix? That's a great question, and thank you so much for watching all the way from Malta. Uh, that's very edifying, and praise God for the for the the, the greatness of technology today, huh? Uh, you know, technically speaking, it is not. And Pope Francis uh, recently addressed this very issue. But what we can call her in regards to this close relationship with her son and what she does in leading us to her son is uh, concerning uh, the titles that Lumen Gentium does permit us to call her, okay? So, in uh, uh, paragraph number 62 of Lumen Gentium, which is the dogmatic constitution on the church in the modern world, light of nations is Lumen Gentium in Latin, we read uh, regarding the maternity of Mary that this maternity of Mary in the order of grace began with the consent which she gave in faith at the Annunciation, and which she sustained without wavering beneath the cross, and lasts until the eternal fulfillment of all the elect, in other words, at the end of time. 
Taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside this salvific duty, but by her constant intercession through, as mother of God, continued to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. By her maternal charity, then, she cares for the brethren of her son, who still journey on earth surrounded by dangers and the like until they are led into the happiness of their true home in heaven. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked by the church under the titles of advocate, auxiliatrix, adjutrix, words in the Latin for, for helper and chief helper, and mediatrix. This, however, is to be so understood that these four titles neither take away from nor add anything to the dignity and efficaciousness of Christ as the one chief mediator. So we don't call her co-redemptrix, and again, you can find easily enough online recent statements from Pope Francis, because the church has never declared that title officially. Instead, we look to Lumen Gentium, and we see that we can address her as advocate, auxiliatrix, uh, adjutrix, and mediatrix. Okay, but these four titles are to be so understood that they neither take away from nor add anything to the dignity and efficaciousness of Christ as the one true and chief mediator. Great question. Thank you so much. All the way from Malta. <laughs> you know, are you familiar with the Aventine Keyhole in Rome? There's a there's a hillside where that has been ceded to the the Knights of Malta and to the military order of the Knights of Malta. So a couple of things. One, in that one little area, you can take three or four steps. I thought it was four, but I can only think of three, where you can take steps and be in three different countries at once uh, mm -hmm. between Malta, because the, the land was given to the order, uh, the Vatican City State, and, of course, Italy. And I think maybe the Roman government or something. There's anyway four things. But there's a door, and if you look you know, squint your eye, close one eye, and look through the keyhole of this door, it looks straight down a perfectly manicured archway hedgerow that leads all the way off into the distance, and right in the middle of the hedgerow through this keyhole is the Dome of St. Peter's. Oh, wow. Wow, and I had not heard about that yeah, at all. Yeah, it is spectacular. If you Google wow. it, there are pictures of it, and it's uh, to have actually— and I, I had the great grace when my daughter and I were in Rome— um, that uh, we didn't know anything about it and just went and looked through the keyhole, and it was, you know, especially powerful when you don't know what's coming and then you see the spectacular image. Yeah, um, amen. Kathy is watching us on Facebook Live, and she wants to know if you see your loved ones when you die. Well, that's a great question, Kathy, and thank you so much for it. You know, the, we do know some things about the glorified and transfigured human body uh, that ends up in heaven. Uh, for those bodies that, and souls that go to heaven to be reunited, uh, after the general judgment, we know specifics because of Christ's glorified risen body. Uh, for example, the four primary characteristics, and I'll just comb through them quickly, although you're asking about when we die, do we see our loved ones at a time before the second coming of Christ? So semper distingue, right? Always distinguish. So first, I want to give the four characteristics, which I know I've done in the past here on the show, of, of, of the glorified and transfigured human body in heaven, okay? And we know these four because Christ exhibited them during the 40 days of post-resurrection appearances. So we have the characteristic of impassibility regards the incapability of suffering, okay? Then we have subtility, which regards man's spiritualized nature after the resurrection, uh, the archetype of the spiritualized body is the risen body of Christ, which emerged from a sealed tomb and penetrated closed doors, like at the time of the doubting Thomas, when they, when they were in the room and the doors were locked, Jesus appears. Uh, there's the, thirdly, there's the characteristic of agility, the capability of the body to obey the soul with the greatest ease and speed of movement that depends only on an act of the will. Okay, and so we see, for example, that, that with the two uh, uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, right after the breaking of the bread, they recognized Jesus, and we're told he vanished from, from them. Huh? So that's agility, the capabil capability of the body to obey the soul with the greatest ease and speed of movement. Or like when Johnette gives Jack an order, you see the same thing. Jack is able to also practice agility. At least I hope he's able to. <laughs> lightning, pure lightning. <laughs> yeah. The speed of lightning, right? And then fourthly, we have clarity, and I love this one. It regards the glorified body being free from everything deformed 
and being filled with complete and resplendent beauty and radiance. So uh, any deformity born with or any imperfection obtained after birth, like a, a cut that left a scar, or a deformity born with, like a club foot or, or missing fingers at the time of birth. That's the difference between a deformity and an imperfection. The imperfection comes after birth. So let's say a car accident leaves you with a scar under your chin that's visible. W whether deformity or imperfection, those will be gone in the glorified risen state. Now, these four characteristics, again, clarity, agility, subtility, and impassibility, I talk about in my book, The Four Last Things, a catechetical guide to death, judgment, heaven, and hell, because the church teaches that, that we will possess these just like Christ did in his human body and which he exhibited, all four of these, during his 40 days of post-resurrection appearances, okay, between uh, his being raised from the dead on Easter Sunday and his ascension into heaven on Ascension Thursday, those 40 days. Now, you're asking about do we see our loved ones when we die, meaning even before the second coming. The church does not teach that, uh, but it doesn't mean that we don't. It remains a mystery. We do know for certain that we do not have physical eyes, but it doesn't mean that God could not give us some intuitive awareness of how our loved ones are doing. But it would not be through a visual sight, it would be through an intuitive sight, especially if we're praying on their behalf. It's EWTN's Open Line Tuesday with Father Wade Menezes. Pray the rosary and help encircle the world in prayer. Join EWTN for the 12th Annual Global Rosary Relay. For the sanctification of priests, this Friday at 7 a.m. and 9.15 a.m. Eastern on EWTN Television and Radio Essentials. The power of prayer simply means that words have an effect. For example, when a couple says, I do, it literally changes two people to becoming one in marriage. When you say, I love you, it changes us and it gives us value. The power of prayer is in the words and in the sentiment, but it's also in the fact that God, who is omnipotent, all-powerful, answers our prayers. And now, the EWTN Family Prayer with Father Joseph. Family, a prayer that we pray together is a powerful prayer. So please pray together with me, our EWTN Family Prayer. Today we pray for those who are suffering with Parkinson's disease. Lord Jesus Christ, consolation of the afflicted, you are our refuge. We pray for those who are suffering the effects of Parkinson's disease. As they lose their physical strength and abilities, increase their spiritual strength and abilities. Renew their inner spirit day after day and through their share in your sufferings, give the grace of conversion to sinners. and their weakness, reveal your strength. Give peace and joy to those who care for them. Amen. What do you want people to remember about you? That will be the topic of our conversation tomorrow on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. On most of these EWTN stations. Now we return to Open Line with Father Wade Menezes. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Once again, our phone lines are on the fritz today, so it's a phones on the fritz edition of EWTN's Open Line Tuesday. But a little technical difficulty is not going to keep a father of mercy down, and Father Wade is ferrying on anyway. Um, we've got a, a, a watcher, I believe, on YouTube. Let me scroll back and make sure I get it right. Um Facebook Live, actually. Virgil's watching us on Facebook Live. And he wants to know if in vitro fertilization is a sin. Okay, that's a great question. And, and we look to Numbers 2376 and 2377 of the Universal Catechism to answer that question. It's the distinction between uh, heterologous artificial insemination, which means other than, and homologous techniques of fertilization, which means same. In other words... The distinction is, is it the same gametes of the couple that, that, is, that is being sought here, or is it other than, okay, the, the hetero, the other than, uh, meaning a third-party member? And, and the distinction is very, very clear. So I'm going to talk about uh, number 2376 first, which talks about the other than, okay? 
uh, the heterologous. So techniques that entail the disassociation of husband and wife by the intrusion of a person other than the couple, say a donation of sperm from a third-party member or ovum, or a surrogate uterus, okay, are gravely immoral. These techniques, which are known as heterologous artificial insemination and fertilization, infringe the child's right to be born of a father and mother known to him or her and bound to each other by marriage. They betray the spouse's right to become a father and a mother only through each other, quote, end quote. Now, 2377 is about techniques that are used when it is only the husband and the wife's seed, for example, or, or egg, that are being used. Now, now listen to this, number 2377, techniques involving only the married couple, homologous artificial insemination and fertilization techniques, are perhaps less reprehensible, yet remain morally unacceptable. Why? They disassociate the sexual act from the procreative act. The act which brings the child into existence is no longer an act by which two persons give themselves to one another, but one that rather entrusts the life and identity of the embryo into the power of doctors and biologists and establishes the domination of technology over the origin and destiny of the human person. Such a relationship of domination is in itself contrary to the dignity and equality that must be common to parents and children. Under the moral aspect, procreation is deprived of its proper perfection when it is not willed as the fruit of the marital conjugal act, that is to say, of the specific act of the spouse's union one with the other. Uh, only respect for the link between the meanings of the conjugal act and respect for the unity of the human being make possible procreation in conformity with the dignity of the human person. So, I'm presuming Virgil's asking about in vitro when the sperm is indeed the husband's, the ovum is indeed the wife's, but they're joined together in a petri dish in a, in a laboratory or a biological science lab. This would, be, this would fall under paragraph number 2377, which is homologous techniques that still disassociate um, the, the beauty, disassociate themselves, these, these activities, from the, the beauty and unitive act conjugally speaking, between the spouses, and so they cannot be sought out. Again, great, great information here, bio biologically speaking, what the church teaches in her bioethics, her morals, because it also infringes upon marriage. If you say that even married couples can do this, then what's to stop uh, any other sexual act that takes place that is not unitive? Because IVF disrupts the unitive aspect of the husband and wife, if you can permit that, then through a slippery slope mentality or rationality, you can say that any sexual activity is okay that's not unitive by its very nature. So the church teaches against IVF precisely to maintain the integrity of the unitive act according to the natural law by God's own design. And look at, my gosh, look at all the, the court cases that have gone to court and spouses divorced and frozen eggs and frozen sperm and this and that and all, all this just, all this extraordinary um, legal drama that's taking place because such activity was permitted in the first place. So also there's the whole theology of the cross here. If a couple can't conceive naturally, um, where is their role in the cross in this and their understanding the role in the cross? Um, this also has to be addressed. When we live in a world that no longer wants to unite itself with the cross, a uh, personal life with the cross of Jesus Christ, we lose the reality of why he came to save us and redeem us and how he did it through his own cross. So these are all peripheral areas, if you will, that need to be addressed when looking at the very specific issue or area of IVF. But Virgil, I encourage you to read that whole section in the catechism. It's, it's, it's under the title, The Gift of a Child. And I encourage any listeners who may have, be having difficulty conceiving right now to also look at this entire section, which isn't that long, actually, that I'm recommending that Virgil look at. It begins with number 2373, and it's titled at the top with, of 2373, The Gift of a Child. And that's from the Universal Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it extends only to 2379. So 2373 to 2379. Great question, Virgil. Thank you so much for asking it.
Again, our phone lines are down today, so we're taking your questions via Facebook Live and YouTube. And Candace actually called us last week, Father Wade, and we ran out of time, and we weren't able to get to her question, uh, which is, what is the church's position on smoking legalized marijuana, which it is legal in her state? Is it a sin, and if so, is it venial or mortal? Okay, great question. To my knowledge, there's nothing from Rome yet on this very topic, other than the fact that you can reason to it by other moral principles that are already in place, okay? Also, noting how marijuana differs in regards to its effects of brain cells as opposed to, say, alcohol, uh, which is more blood-oriented when when the effect takes place of intoxication, okay? Um, So my understanding from the experts is that uh, for medicinal purposes, not recreational purposes, but for medicinal purposes, that it can be used, but even then the person would want to work with their doctor on that and make sure that the rest of their physical health would permit such use medicinally of marijuana for pain relief. The church has never had a problem by of looking to natural remedies, uh, herbs and so forth, uh, natural remedies for pain relief. The church has never had a problem with that, but we have to take it case by case and see if the person would benefit from it. And you do that through your consultation with your doctors, which the church would put great stock in, the relationship between patient and and doctor, and have your doctor uh, help you analyze uh, the best benefit for you for pain relief, whether or not uh, the use of marijuana medicinally, again, I'm talking only medicinally here, would prove helpful for you, maybe on a trial run, for for example. But for recreational purposes, it's my understanding that, no, the church would not look to that. And we're seeing more and more cases now in the news where people are impaired after even smoking the um, permitted levels in certain states. They're being pulled over because they're notice- noticeably driving in impaired uh, ways. And come to find out, they're not intoxicated with alcohol. They have been smoking marijuana. So the church uh, would say that for recreational purposes, no, not on a regular basis, not not on uh, any basis from what my understanding is on this. And I, I look forward f- for something specific coming from Rome in this regard. Even with alcohol, you know, we, we don't see a problem with, with a glass of wine, uh, a beer, it, it, Alcohol in and of itself is not intrinsically evil like, say, abortion is, huh? That's an intrinsic evil. We would never teach that alcohol or use of alcohol is intrinsically evil, but it can become an evil in a person's life through the abuse of it. But the difference between alcohol and use of marijuana is you have impairment through blood versus impairment and actual uh, uh, destroying of brain cells. Um, and, and so this has to be taken into effect when you're looking at the overall adverse effects of both. Thank you for a great question, Candice. We greatly appreciate it. And once again, our phone lines are down today, so we're not taking your uh, phone calls today. But if you uh, want to log in to EWTN's YouTube channel or Facebook page, we are taking your questions there. Uh, here's a question that I, I know firsthand, Father, that, that uh, bothers some folks, and, and hopefully you can give a little comfort here. Um, there's a gentleman who's watching on YouTube, and he says, I'm 75 years old and afraid of dying. Just the thought of it makes me feel dread. Do we receive any graces from God to help us go through death with peace when the time comes? Absolutely. And for those who live their life according to God's moral law, they should enter into the dying process with great peace. And, I, and I've seen this with people. And this is from uh, Anne, by the way. I'm sorry. From Anne. So, Anne, thank you so much for your question. You know, first of all, there's no need to be scrupulous about the reality of death when the church herself teaches in the Universal Catechism, very, very beautifully, in fact, that the literal physical act of dying, physically, the literal physical act of dying, the separation of the soul from the body, that's the definition of, of physical death, that literal act is what fully incorporates us into Christ's own death, precisely because he did it for us. And that should be be of great, great comfort for the person looking to death, that they can unite their death to Christ's death, 
okay? This is one of the evils of euthanasia when we want to take death into our own human realm and human realm only and want to be final arbiter of our own life. Uh, it, it takes away from embracing the cross and embracing pain and, and so forth, although the church teaches very clearly that you can take pain relievers, uh, even morphine, uh, even though morphine has the tolerated side effect of maybe hastening to the death, if the, body is, if the body is naturally shutting down anyway, there's no need to take any extraordinary means. You can let the, the ordinary means take their natural course. So uh, it is very, very possible to die a very peaceful death, even in regards to pain, because the church permits the, the use of the pain relief, again, even morphine. And that has to be stressed, because I, I've met a lot of people who think that morphine is an automatic evil, that, that, it, they're, that by taking the morphine, it alleviates the pain and suffering, and therefore it's not good. The church wouldn't want that. That's not what the church teaches. The church teaches you can actually increase morphine levels if the body is naturally already shutting down anyway, and at least two to three doctors have confirmed that the body is naturally shutting down because at that juncture, we have one concern and one concern only, to keep the person uh, in comfort. That's our main purpose at that juncture when the body is naturally shutting down is to keep them comfortable. But I'm veering off track a little bit because the question has to do with actual fear of death. So I want to make it clear that the church's actual teaching is that physical death, which we define as the soul separating from the body, um, is indeed the final act that incorporates us into Christ's own death, and that's a very beautiful, real thought. And for one who partook of the sacraments up to that time in their life, regular confession, regular Eucharist, anointing of the sick if they ever had a surgery, uh, or were going to have a surgery, even an outpatient surgery, because the church teaches that even with outpatient surgery, you, it's reason enough to uh, have the anointing of the sick because you're going under anesthesia, and a lot of people don't know that teaching as well. For example, you're getting all four wisdom teeth pulled. You're going to go in at 7 a.m. that morning. You'll be home by 4 that afternoon. Uh, because it involved anesthesia, you can uh, get, receive the anointing of the sick. So wanting to look to the sacramental economy of the church, meaning all that the sacraments offer and in their frequency and taking advantage of that, is part and parcel with our living, our Catholic life. The sacraments are important. The sacraments are not lollipops. They're not handed out at will. That said, they're there for the asking when the time is right for each one. So monthly confession, weekly Eucharist. If you're struggling with a particular vice, uh, go to confession more often, even if you don't happen to fall into that vice during that interval of two-week confession. Let's say you're going to confession now every two weeks, and you had a successful two-week period where you didn't fall into the vice. Still go to confession at the two-week mark and tell the confessor that. Say, Father, I'm not aware. my last confession was two weeks ago, and by the grace of God, I'm not, not aware of any mortal sins, but I wanted to come anyway for the graces, okay? Or, or a regular monthly confession in honor of the Sacred Heart of Jesus or the Immaculate Heart of Mary, especially this month now, Right? because of, of it being June, uh, the, the, the uh, month of the Sacred Heart. And the Immaculate Heart always follows the Sacred Heart celebration. So, you know, I address in the chapter on death in my book, The Four Last Things, A Catechetical Guide to Death, Judgment, Heaven, and Hell. It's a short book, only 110 pages, five chapters, titled respectively, Death, Judgment, Heaven, and Hell, and the Necessity of the Spiritual Life is chapter five. And I, I talk about what the church teaches about death and how striving for the sacramental economy, striving for a life of charity, striving to be a faithful son or daughter of the church, we have nothing to be fearful of or scrupulous of as we approach death. Uh, the daily rosary, the daily divine mercy chaplet, oh, the chaplet, what a beautiful prayer to pray as we approach death or as a loved one approaches death. Our Lord tells St. Faustina, pray the chaplet for those who are nearing death. You know, it's a beautiful, beautiful prayer. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. We're asking for the mercy of God to be imparted upon this person. Our Lord says, even if the, even if the person was a most hardened sinner, when the chaplet is prayed for them at the hour of their death, I will soften their heart. And so the choice is still theirs to open up or not, but our Lord will even soften their heart when the chaplet is prayed on their behalf. So that's a very, very beautiful truth, too. So, you know, I encourage you to get my book and to read the chapter, read the whole book, but especially the chapter on death, and may it bring you, Anne, great, great comfort. 
Um, I don't know if you've checked out our newest program on here on EWTN Radio, The Miracle Hunter with Michael O'Neill. He delves into the fascinating world of miracles, and he takes listeners on a hunt that explores the greatest mysteries and marvels of the Catholic Church. That's The Miracle Hunter with Michael O'Neill, Saturday at 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on EWTN Radio. Uh, Adam is watching us on YouTube, Father, and he says, uh, joining into the conversation from earlier, What does the Church teach about adopting embryos that have already been created through no fault of their own and the biological parents receive no financial compensation? Okay, great question. That's discussed among theologians now. However, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI has answered that in the Dignity of the Human Person document, Personae Dignitatis, and also in Donum Vitae, the Gift of Life document that came out, both from the Sacred Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. Great, great question, Adam. Um, To take those embryos that are frozen, so the sperm has already met the ovum, and that it is indeed an embryo, it's not a potential human person, it is a human person with potential, if it's given the chance for a nine-month gestation, right? But to implant it into an adoptive couple, even married couple, um, even with no financial compensation when the embryo is not paid for, still involves the implantation per per se, still involves um, a method outside of the conjugal act of the married couple. So it's not permitted, according to these two documents signed off by Pope Benedict XVI. Because once you say that it can be conceived in a way outside the conjugal act, it opens up a very, very dark door and dark world, as we are already seeing in some of these court cases. So in Donum Vitae, the document says, and and again, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI signed off on this. I believe at the time he was still Cardinal Ratzinger uh, in Donum Vitae. Uh, these frozen embryos remain in an absurd fate. That's with an F, fate. They remain in an absurd fate because they cannot be implanted because that would go against the church's teaching on the conjugal act, nor can they be destroyed because they're human persons with potential. They're not potential human persons. They are human persons with potential. So again, to say that you could open up the door just in this one instance uh, in a homologous situation or just in this one instance in a heterologous uh, situation, you open up the door to the whole homologous category, to the whole heterologous category in ways that are not permitted because they are outside of the conjugal act. But I want to make it clear, you've asked a very, very good question because there are theologians who are trying to embrace the current teaching and who are still giving uh, discussion, conjectural discussion, uh, on on is there a way that something could still be done? Uh, The Church has said, no, there isn't, but again, uh, it's been answered in the document, but then again, there's still theologians that are talking about it, so in, 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 good, in good standing theologians. So, but they have to work from the standpoint of these two documents. So I urge you to look at Donum Vitae, and I urge you to look at, at uh, the dignity of the human person, dignitatis personae, I believe is the Latin. Look at those two documents, and all of it is right there in regards to frozen embryos. Great question. Thank you so much. Here's a wonderful question from Desiree, who's watching on Facebook Live. She said she's working toward conversion to Catholicism. She was baptized Episcopalian, and she wants to know if this is a proper baptism for the Catholic Church, and if not, can she be rededicated in this church? Great question. Well, in the Catholic Church, there's, there's no such thing as a rededication. You're either going to be baptized or not. So, for example, if... Well, let me back up a little bit. You have to ascertain, was your Episcopalian baptism done in a proper Trinitarian formula in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit during the three-time immersion or the three-time pouring as each divine person was invoked? If you can ascertain that from your parish church, your Episcopalian parish church, then the Catholic Church will accept that Episcopalian baptism because the Catholic Church accepts Uh, prior baptisms that are valid in our Protestant ecclesial communities of our Protestant brothers and sisters. So, for example, I I knew a Methodist gentleman who had an actual framed baptismal certificate from his Methodist church from years ago that said 
Mr. So-and-so, and it had his name, his, his Methodist pastor wrote it out, his name, but, but the certificate itself was pre-printed, was baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit on such and such a date in such and such Methodist church. Well, my Methodist buddy, he showed that to his Catholic pastor at his Catholic church, and the Catholic said, oh, we, we have reason to believe clearly that you were baptized with the, the proper Trinitarian formula by virtue of how your Methodist baptismal certificate that you had framed behind glass is worded. So there's no need to conditionally baptize you. Now, if he didn't have that, if the Methodist friend of mine didn't have that, and he wasn't sure how he was baptized, because some denominations are very liberal and progressive in their thinking, you know, I baptize you in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, or the Sanctifier, or the God of the West, the God of the North, the God of the South, whatever. And, and he just had, if he had no way of knowing or ascertaining that he was baptized with a proper Trinitarian formula, then the Catholic pastor would have baptized him conditionally in this way. Uh, I'll call the gentleman John. John, if you are not already baptized, I now baptize you or I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In other words, if he was baptized validly in the Methodist church, then what the Catholic pastor just did does not take effect. But if he was not baptized validly in the Methodist church, what the Catholic pastor just did did take effect. So he's now certainly baptized, okay? But you're baptized only once. It's only, remember, baptism is one of the three sacraments of the seven that can only be received once. That's it, one time. Because of the indelible mark or spiritual character they leave on the Christian soul, never to be erased. So baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. For those of you watching YouTube, I'm pointing to my Roman collar. Baptism, confirmation, holy orders can only be received once. So a conditional baptism in the Catholic Church, the pastor would say, if you are not already baptized or if you have not already been baptized, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And, and thus, if the first one was not valid, the second one now is. Thus, it's really the first one. The second one is really the first one because the first one in the Protestant church was invalid. But if, if the Protestant one was valid, then what the Catholic pastor just did meant nothing. It, it meant nothing because you can only be baptized once. So my question to you, Desiree, would be, do you have some type of way to ascertain if you were validly baptized um, in the Episcopalian church. And it's not enough just to look to the ritual books because your Episcopalian ritual books will have the proper formula for a Trinitarian baptism. You have to ascertain that your, pa your Episcopalian pastor did it in the right way. Or was he a, a progressive who did his own wording, okay? But fear not, if you cannot ascertain it, then you will be baptized conditionally in the Catholic church as I just described it. Great question, Desiree. Thank you so much. Just a couple minutes left, Father Wade. Red is watching on YouTube, and he wants to know how many times a terminally ill person can receive uh, the anointing of the sick. The anointing of the sick, great. We used to call it extreme unction before Vatican II, which means extreme oiling. Unctio in the Latin means oiling, but now we call it the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, because one of the great theologies out of Vatican II was that the sacrament could be administered now apart from just at death's door. We used to call it extreme unction because it could only be given right when death was imminent. Well, now canon law says the following, that one could be, one can be, um, ba uh, one can receive the anointing of the sick, quote, whenever one begins to be in danger of death because of sickness or old age. Whenever one begins to be in sickness of danger of death because of sickness or old age. So, so whenever that happens, so, or, or if you're going to be put under anesthesia, as I said earlier, even if it's an outpatient surgery, even a colonoscopy, they're going to put you under anesthesia. You can still receive the anointing of the sick because anesthesia can be a dangerous thing, right? So whenever one begins to be in danger of death because of sickness or old age, you can receive the sacrament of the anointing. Would you leave us with a blessing? I certainly will, Jack. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, descend upon all of our Open Line Tuesday listeners and remain with each and every one of you this day and always. St. Joseph, terror of demons. Pray for us. On behalf of our host, Father Wade Menezes, our producer, Michael McCall, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in. Back at it tomorrow with Father Mitch. Until then, God bless.
EWTN News In-Depth is 